And this is, this is Nico, our, our short-haired border collie cross cattle dog. Nico, Nico often gets scared. He, he's, he's got a bravado and he's brave when he wants to be, but sometimes he gets scared when there's a loud noise that's new or different, a, a noise he's not used to. It can scare him. Or if, if he's done something wrong and we raise our voices, it scares him and he runs away. Or if there's an approaching storm that he can feel and hear, he will, he will run away. Often he'll go to the, the back gate where, where it's, it's high, I guess, and, and surrounded, and maybe he feels safe there. Or, or he'll go out onto one of the outside lounges where, where he can curl up with the rugs near the arms and feel cocooned. And I get that because I, I, there are times when I just want to escape from the world, from life, from everything, and I go and hide in, 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 a, in a confined space that feels safe. I guess we all do. And, and as I come to the, the stories of Easter, it's this image of being cocooned away, protected from the world that I see. There are various stories. There's the one in Mark's story that, that we've also read this year, where the women go to the tomb to prepare the body for burial. But the tomb is open and they go in and there's this stranger who says, are you looking for Jesus of Nazareth? He's risen. He's gone back to Galilee. Tell the disciples he'll meet you there. And the women leave confused and terrified and they say nothing to anyone. And that's really the original ending of Mark's gospel. Someone's added some extra verses from 9 to 16, but that's where it ends. In other words, go back to the start of the story, go back to where it all began and relive this story of Jesus and engage it in your life and you'll experience this power of resurrection. But the stories we read today come from John's story of Jesus. And in John 20, which was the original ending, it's kind of a very gentle and soft story. Uh, on Easter Day, uh, a colleague of mine, uh, Reverend Ian Pearson, who's a retired United Church minister, was preaching, and he, he offered this image. He said, you know, often in churches on Easter Day, there's trumpets, either real trumpets or the organ sound will be trumpet, trumpets, triumphal, glorious, powerful, mighty, proclaiming resurrection. Christ is risen, he is risen indeed. And it's loud and bold and brassy. But he said, as I read the stories, the image I get is more of gentle candles in the darkness. And the candle appears here, and then there, and over here, and over here. The risen Christ gently appears like a soft candlelight in the darkness of the world and gradually manifests a new life, a new way. And I think that's what John's Gospel really holds. The first part that we read on Easter Day is a Mary going to the tomb in the darkness. And darkness is really important in John's Gospel because darkness represents, it symbolizes the darkness of the world, of life, the, the, the evil we perpetrate on each other, or the, the fear, the anguish, the despair, the grief, the loss, the pain, the suffering that we all endure. And it contrasts that with the light, the light of Christ, the light of God, the light of God's love that breaks into the world, into our lives in, in profound ways and brings new life. Mary goes to the tomb and it's dark, the pre-dawn darkness. The darkness of her world, her life, her grief, her loss, her pain, of the one who, who has loved her into life and, and whom she loved and has followed is dead and in a tomb. And she goes to prepare this loving act of preparing his body for burial. And as she goes, she wonders how she'll move this stone away from the tomb. The tomb that is sealed, cold, dark, and lonely. And, and, and in the tomb is the source of her grief and her loss and her pain, her despair, her bewilderment, her confusion, her suffering. And I think the tomb symbolises this, this, this place of, of lonely, cold darkness in our lives that, 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 that gets into us and holds us 
in fear, in uncertainty, in, in confusion, in, in despair. All our pain and our grief is symbolised in this cold, empty, sealed tomb. And as she goes, she realises or discovers that the stone has been rolled away. And for me, it, she goes in, or she doesn't go in, but disciples go in and it's empty. The, the pre-dawn light is now filtering into this dark, cold tomb and revealing the emptiness. For me, it's an image of, of the love that overcomes fear, the love that will not let us go, the love that, that, that comes into our, our lonely, desolate space, our tomb, and brings life. The light pushes the darkness away, the darkness of despair and grief and loss and pain. Yes, those scars and those remnants and those things remain, but this love holds us and leads us out into a new way. And the second part of that chapter, the story we read this week, is of the disciples who are hidden away from the world in a room of solid walls and locked doors cocooned away, hidden away from the world, from their fear, from the, the religious authorities that have arrested and tried Jesus and hand him over to the Romans, to the Roman armies and, and leaders who are still present in the city, who have, who have sentenced him and killed him on a cross. They're afraid. But it's their grief, it's their loss, it's their pain, it's their despair, their bewilderment, their uncertainty about the future. They are lost and they are hidden away in this safe place. And it's into this safe place that the risen Christ materialises. And he says to them, peace, peace be with you. Don't fear. And he shows them his woundedness. And then he breathes on them and says, receive a Holy Spirit. It's, it's kind of hearkening back to that creation story where God created humans out of the dust of the earth and then breathed the spirit of life into them, animating them and giving them life. And Jesus breathes the spirit, the spirit of life, of resurrection, of love, of hope, and then commissions them, go into the world to be people of reconciliation. Go and forgive people, forgive sins. Go and bring healing, reconciliation and make peace in the world. If you make peace, if you offer forgiveness, there will be forgiveness. If you withhold forgiveness, it will be withheld. And there will be more violence and conflict and struggle. Go into the world and bring peace. Be people of peace and life. And, and then he disappears. And they're amazed and puzzled and confused. And they tell Thomas when Thomas comes, Thomas wasn't with them. And Thomas says, I want to believe, but I can't unless I see and feel for myself. I can't believe. And so a week later, they're in the same place. They're still in this room of locked wall, uh, solid walls and locked doors, hidden away from the world. Even though they've experienced this this, had this experience of this risen Christ, they're still locked away in fear and grief and uncertainty and bewilderment and confusion behind the solid walls and locked doors. And Jesus once again materialises in their midst and says to Thomas, Thomas, don't fear, have peace. Have a look. This is me. I'm known by my wounds, my scars. And he says, I believe. And then Jesus disappears again. And that's kind of the end of the story. These stories are not triumphal, glorious, victory, might and power, the way that we'd like to proclaim them. These disciples, part of their bewilderment is they were looking for a Messiah who was 
going to come, a political ruler, leader, king, who would come in glory and power and might, would, would get the armies of Israel together and vanquish the foes, the imperial foes of Rome, and restore glory and honour and power and might. And they saw this in Jesus for some reason. And, and the disciples, I guess, were looking forward to living in the reflected glory and power and might and wealth and wonder. But that was never who Jesus was. It was nothing of his teaching, his life, his ministry and what he did. It's the opposite. It's humility and vulnerability. And it's this gentle resurrection that breaks into their, their grief, their loss, their delusions and invites them into a way of love and reconciliation and peace in the world. Not a way of violence and warfare and fighting, not a way of conflict, not a way of holding on to uh, the wrongs that have been done, but to offer forgiveness and love and hope to all the world. And this gentle way of resurrection breaks into us and, it, and it's like a germinating seed that, that slowly breaks open within us and slowly dissipates its love and its power within us, transforming us from within that we may flourish and bring flourishing to the world. These resurrection stories are gentle and powerful, strong in a vulnerable, humble, gentle, quiet way like that flickering candle that, that shows its light and, and is added to another and another and another. And the more of us that, that hold these candles, these lights, this light of Christ, the brighter it becomes. And the more love grows and the more the world can be transformed into what it can become and be and what we need it to be. This is what Easter is about. Let's hold the story closely, gently in the cocoons of our lives where we're hiding from the world, when we're in the midst of fear and desperation and, and loneliness and, and, and all those dark feelings, that's when the light of Christ shines most brightly, where it comes to us most intently and where it gives us hope and life. This is Easter and I invite you into this journey, this journey in the way of Jesus to follow him into the darkness of the world, to be people of peace and hope and life, people who bring love.